It is, um, it is a real pleasure to be here. Um, some of you uh, see some familiar faces in the audience. Um, some of you know that over the last few years, um, a lot of the work that I've been doing as Director of Housing have been focused on uh, housing supply and housing demand measures and unlocking sites and all the kind of physical bits of housing. Um, and that's good because housing's been um, a sort of a big part of the government's agenda and continues to be a priority for the Prime Minister and others. And it's quite nice, more recently, I've taken back on responsibility for homelessness and some of the specialized housing brief. And I'm very, very pleased that it's, um, it's all of housing now that um, falls within my directorate. Um, and obviously, thinking about housing in the context of people and um, you know, particular groups of people and the kinds of things we need to be building in is, is really, really important. So, so thank you, and, well, and I'm, I'm really pleased to be back, really. Uh, and I, I suspect, though, many of you in the audience are more expert than I. Um, I'm still catching up with some of the things that's been happening over the, the last few years in, in the more specialized field. Um, but what I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased is, is obviously if in the course of the conversation or the discussion people are interested in some of the wider housing investments we're making, I'm certainly happy to pick those up in discussion. Um, some of you might know as well that um, years ago I was involved in the government's strategy for an aging society, lifetime homes and lifetime neighborhoods. And I'm, I'm really pleased when I start looking at some of the work that's emerged from that, that there's been a, a certain, let's say, constancy in terms of some of those things and some of what the sector has done to bring that forward. But obviously the time is ripe for a fresh commitment and for moving forward. And so I thought what I should do is just say a little bit about the context in government. Um, fill you in a bit on, on what the ministers have been discussing, and, and I know that um, Lord Philkin also mentioned the various roundtables, but perhaps I can just give you a little bit more of an idea of some of those things that are emerging to provide a, a kind of broader context for taking this forward. So first of all, the first slide is something I think many, many of you are aware of. This isn't new information, but, but I, do, I do feel it's quite important by just thinking a, a bit about not only the changing demographics in terms of population, but just where are people living now. Obviously, where people are living now actually shapes some of the decisions and options and choices and aspirations that might, they might have going forward. We're all pretty clear about um, the increase. The, in, the, in this case, I put up the, the statistic around the 60% of projected increase in households um, headed by someone 65 plus. We all know that the statistics for those over 85, are, it's even a higher percentage. So we know about the numbers. Um, but currently, I mean, I do think it's very interesting to see um, sort of how it breaks down. And in particular, I won't go through each of the numbers, but I think it is quite interesting that, of course, 76 percent of older households are owner occupiers, and, and, and that is a, a sort of a continuing theme, really, in terms of thinking about the housing. But also, I think what's quite interesting is that only 6% are private sector tenants. And one of the things in, in my broader work that we do is, is we're investing quite a lot in expansion of the private rented sector, institutional investment in the rented sector, really acknowledging that there's actually a demographic shift beginning to happen in that sector as well. So it is something about where people live now, and also I'm um, thinking about what that might mean in terms of the choices, the kinds of housing they might want to go to in the future. Um, in terms of specialist housing, um, only about 5% of older people now live in specialist housing, about 500,000 units, 100,000 only in the private sector, so mostly public sector housing, and mostly social rented. So again, if you think about what we have in terms of specialized housing, very much dominated by the public sector, um, and um, most of it is social rented, affordable rented. So it just kind of makes me start to think about you know, the starting point for us and what are we really saying about diversification and choice. And I'm sure you've been talking about some of that um, during the course of today. In terms of supply and demand then, I think we know that the demographic change is shaping the demand for the housing choices. And I think one of the interesting debates for us all to have is, you know, the, the sort of aspirations, the expectations of our parents or our grandparents, ourselves, our children, are all going to be quite different and, and shaped by that, as well as shaped by other things happening um, in terms of the economy and debt and whatever. But obviously that's, that's really important to understand that, and I don't mean just the numbers, but un try to understand that to help us in planning um, the future. There's currently an estimated gap of about 45,000 units a year for people with support needs, so we know that, and that leads then into what we can do in terms of investment. 
Some of the demand might be met through adaptation, floating support, but obviously not enough to meet all of that. Now, I think what's really, really interesting is the statistic that says that about six million older people would consider moving to more suitable housing. So it's not that people are unwilling to move, and I'm sure, again, you've, you've picked up on some of those things now, but the question is, what are their options and, and sort of what are they thinking about and at what age, et cetera, in terms of moving to alternative housing? Um, the other aspect, of course, which, which is really important just to acknowledge, is the extent to which um, older households have um, quite significant equity in their homes. Um, the Council of Mortgage Lenders estimates that's about one trillion, which is pretty significant. So obviously there are opportunities there. There might also be threats, but there are opportunities there uh, for households to support either a move or indeed to support um, their, their needs of, over time, funding adaptations and other things. And again, I'm sure some of you have been talking about that in the specific sessions, but, but again, worth just bearing that in mind. But as I said earlier, there is, there is really limited choice, and I think that's one of the themes that just keeps coming across to me, uh, coming back to this, is how limited the real options are, um, and yet people want to move. And I think it's interesting that about 70% of the s current private supply is from one provider. Now, some of you might recall the work that Richard Best and others did in the happy, the happy work, and that was one of the most significant things that came out of that, was about how do we try to get mainstream house builders, how do we get more people actually coming into this market and providing accommodation. And I'm, I'm just struck that actually, um, from the time I developed the strategy, however many years ago that was, five or six years ago, to now, there hasn't been that much of a shift in terms of, of, of the provider sector, um, the private sector. So I think there's a bit of a challenge for us there. We know that moving to specialist retirement housing can improve um, quality of life. There's a fair amount of evidence around that. And I think um, what is quite helpful is to think about the types of movers, depending on where you are in your life, cycle and what you're looking at for your housing. And I've, I've listed just three here. One is, you know, lifestyle movers, maybe typically a bit younger maybe, but seeking a better quality of life. And that is, and I know um, Hanover and Richard Best has done some work recently about that kind of people in their 50s and, and, and looking at the choices there. Planners, um, again, the middle age range, maybe thinking about moving um, ahead of time, and then the crisis movers, which are, are usually much older, and, and often they move because of ill health, and that's a very, very tricky thing. I think it's fair to say that an awful lot of what we've got available is for the third group, and then we might even challenge whether that's even, even the right kind of option for them. I think that the striking thing for me, and this is just 9-10 uh, statistics, and, and I couldn't find anything more recent, but only 1.7% of households over 65 had moved within the last year. So we've got, we've got a kind of a, an interesting triangle here of people saying they'd be willing to move if there was something suitable, um, not very many options, and then not many people moving. So uh, maybe it's not a triangle, but you can see that it all kind of comes together in terms of a conclusion about what we might need to do next. Now, the government's approach so far has really been around three strands. And, and it's interesting because these were three strands that did actually come out of the strategy that we did however many years ago. Um, this is what I mean about, I, I find it interesting that some of that work has continued to this day. So that's good work for all of you. Um, and it's a question now of what we do next. But the strands have been basically trying to provide support that those for people who want to stay in their own homes. Obviously, the Disabled Facilities Grant is, is a large chunk of that. And um, we got confirmation of 220 million pounds for 15, 16. So that was good news through the spending review. And that was an increase, a substantial increase. The second is around ensuring the right advice is available, obviously funding first stop, and then I think the other thing is the funding that's now going into local casework in 15 areas, which is about a more bespoke advice service um, for people when they're trying to make these choices. And then finally, it is about trying to strengthen choice, and there, obviously there's investment through the care and support specialized housing fund. But I think the, the key thing really is, is some of the more recent work going on around more cross-government working to, to think about housing, care, health, and well-being. And I want to say a bit more about that. So in terms of better in integration, um, there is quite a lot going on, and, and one wouldn't want to say it's all there yet. 
but obviously the, the first thing is the care bill which does position housing much more centrally to the provision of care and there is a duty on authorities to integrate services housing with health um, now of course that's that's a bill that's legislation and there is is always a gap between legislation and there's a whole issue about what what that might mean in terms of implementation at a local level but that's quite a big step forward from what we've, we've had before. And I think it just shows that there's a recognition within the Department of Health that housing is, is important and, um, and I think more important than ever before. I mentioned the Care and Support Specialized Housing Fund. Again, this is 315 million that the Department of Health is investing for the development of specialist housing. Again, that's quite a bit different from previous years where it would be the Department for Communities and Local Government bidding for funding and then investing in the funding and that's being delivered through the Homes and Communities Agency and the GLA. And then finally, it's the Better, the Better Care Fund, which is the $3.8 billion investment for integration of health and social care to be pooled locally, local authorities and clinical commissioning groups. My colleagues on the local government side of DCLG are obviously working very closely with, with local authorities around how that funding can be used for real transformation of services. And I think there's an opportunity here. I mean, we know that budgets are being squeezed across the public sector, but this fund and the way it's being set up, there is an opportunity to get involved in how that could actually try to shift um, some of the more traditional ways of, of, of service provision. But there is, as I said earlier, a lot more to do, and it does require fresh thinking. And I think challenges do remain, but, but not just for government, um, but the sector must also engage. And I think the thing that keeps striking me, and I'm, I must be, I think I'm in that middle-aged approaching early planning group um, that um, is thinking about this as well. I see there's, there's tremendous effective demand for alternatives, for downsizing, and for other things. And I, yet, certainly when I personally look around, there aren't a lot of options. And I just, there is a bit of a challenge here as to why, you know, what are the barriers? Why is the private sector not responding more? The reality is, and a lot of the work I do now on housing, is that government um, investment has, is, is under, you know, constraint, we're under fiscal constraints. That's not likely to change um, post-election. So we've got to be quite innovative about how we look at investment and how we lever in private investment um, to build the kind of housing we need, including the kind of housing that older people might need to move on to. So I think we've got some challenges there. Now, ministers have kick-started these discussions. There have been two roundtables with the housing minister, DWP, Department of Health. Some of you have been involved in that, and, and it has provided quite a good basis just to begin to explore some of the barriers that are around and what we need to do next. And some of the issues being um, raised is actually the emphasis, again, on advice and information and have we got it right, because obviously people need to have that to start planning early for the changes in their life. The role of the planning system to encourage development and more housing. The, the MPPF makes it pretty clear that local authorities should be planning um, for older people. They should be integrating those in their plans. They should be thinking about that as they carry forward their housing developments. But obviously, there's a question of translating that document into reality. Um, the issues around existing housing, as well as going forward in terms of new housing, going back to what I just said earlier about significant housing stock that is there in the social sector. Um, a fair amount of it is um, smaller, bed sits, et cetera, so there's obviously um, some constraints on the redevelopment of that, that accommodation, but actually we need to look in total, building the new and also what's existing currently. Also, I think um, a general theme that's come up quite a lot in the round tables is that more attractive offer to downsizing um, and, and really trying to understand what needs to be um, available, what we need to be developing so that people are making, are empowered to make real choices about their housing. So quite a few interesting issues arising from that. Um, one of the things the minister is very, very keen on is learning from best practice or good practice. We know there's a lot of good practice that already exists. These are just some of the projects um, that, you know, I've sort of pulled out as examples, but um, Sunderland facilitating non-grant funded extra care housing. 
Um, in my travels to different places, I've heard about local authorities using their local authority land, putting that in, <clears throat> developing alternatives for people to move to it, and whatever. So there are, there are some things around land and assets that can be done, good, good practice um, opportunities. Mixed retirement um, villages, the Extra Care Charitable Trust, well, I've mentioned First Stop. And then there's a, a multiple, multiple um, number of things through the home improvement agencies and other services. So it's not as if there isn't, there isn't enough there. There's a huge amount of good practice to look at, to understand, and see, see what would be required to, to, to uh, promulgate it. So what next? I just thought. Um, I would say a little bit about um, the project. We're, some of you may know that we're now um, going out to tender for a project on older people's housing, and that is both about research to provide a package of evidence, and I know again Lord Filkin mentioned earlier the evidence base, so we're quite keen that in thinking about how do we take a refreshed look, how do we move this forward, can we, can we look again at that, and that will be one important part, but also to help us develop policies going forward. So, so what are the barriers, what are the things which, if you could just do one or two things, what are the things that you would do that would really have a, a big impact? And so there is an opportunity for you to contribute to that. Um, Obviously, we want you to help us shape that piece of work as we go forward, and I, the email address of Tracy is up there in case you want to make any direct contact. So thanks very much, and look forward to discussions. Thanks.